Hello and welcome to Brightstorm's free ACT webinar. We're really excited to have you here. My name is Oscar. I'm a member of the Brightstorm team. And if you have studied on our ACT section on our website, you will recognize the face next to me. And that is our ACT expert, Devorah Goldblatt. Hey, Devorah. Hi. So um, before we get started, we just want to learn a little bit more about who you are. So if you can just answer this quick questionnaire that we have right here. Let us know who you are. Great. Looks like we have all of the responses in. And looks like the majority of you guys are students. So we are really excited to have all of you here with us right now. We have a lot of useful information that we're going to provide you with, and we really think it's going to be helpful for you for the ACT and for other things as well. This is our home page. We make high school easy. And like I said, study, ask, and advice are the three sections that we have on our website that allows us to make high school easy. So when you come to our study section, you can choose the subject that you're looking for. Let's say, for example, Algebra 2. And let's say you want to learn more about sequences and series. Well, you can check out sequences and series, subtopics, arithmetic series. And not only will you be able to learn about the concept of how arithmetic series works, but you'll also be able to find sample problems for all of those, for everything that's connected to that. And so that what our sample problem videos let you do is really get a deeper understanding of every subject. It's really helpful and it's really easy to use. So that's something that you should know when you're exploring our study videos. We not only cover the topic, but also um, sample problems of how different formulas work. Now, if you recognize Deborah's face, that's probably because you have come to our ACT section right here under test prep. And when you go here, you'll see that we cover every section of the ACT. Well, Deborah does, actually. And that includes the English, the math, the reading, the science, and the writing section. And not only does she cover that section in our, in our ACT section, but she also goes over... Um, she also goes over like sample problems and other things like that. And if you also, if you, you can also take practice tests. So you can take like a diagnostic of the ACT and you can also take the full length test. You can take two different full length tests. And so what that allows you to do is learn your strengths and weaknesses. And once you understand what you need help with, then you can go back and see all of the different study videos that you, that, that can help you improve some of the subject areas that you're kind of shaky on. Another really cool thing about our study section is our ACT Red Book. And the ACT Red Book, for those who might not be familiar with it, is the official study guide for the ACT. And it includes five real tests. And so when you're going over the ACT Red Book and you come across a section that you're a question in a section that you're not familiar with, you don't know how to solve the problem, Devora helps you by giving you a step-by-step -step solution to that problem. So let's say, for example, you're working on test one in the math section and you don't know how to solve question number 20. Well, you just come to our ACT Red Book section, check that out, and you can get a video, a step-by-step -step solution for that within, within our ACT Red Book section. It's a really helpful. You really won't find any information like that anywhere else. Actually, we're the only place where you can find um, video solutions for the ACT Red Book. So that's how that works. And that's all included. Everything that you find in our study section is included in our study plan. And our two new features on Brightstorm are the Ask and Advice section. And these two features are included in our unlimited plan. So when you go to our Ask section, you'll see Genie. And the way that our Ask section, our Ask section with Genie works is that you get to ask three questions every month. That's why we call it Genie, because it's like three wishes. And it's the way to get answers to math problems that you just can't solve on your own. So if you're stuck on, your home, on a homework assignment or studying for a test, just take a picture of the problem, send it to us, and you'll get a step-by-step -step solution within 48 hours. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, we have some sample problems from actual users who have used Genie right here. They send a question like this. They've taken a, a picture. And then they get an answer like this. And it looks like something that you would find in a textbook, but it's not. This is actually coming from our math tutors. Um, these are 
these are specific to the questions that our users have asked. And so it's not just about getting the answer to the problem, it's about learning how to solve the problem. And that's what you get to do with Genie. Now let's go to our next section, which is our advice section. And this is where you're going to get answers to questions that you won't find anywhere else, not in textbooks and not anywhere else on the internet. We have a college admissions counselor who's an expert, and she provides students with the information they need to do well in high school, but also to prepare for college. So if you go down here, you'll see some of the different sections that we cover, how to get better grades, extracurricular activities and internships, make your college applications shine, and nail your college essay. You can go to all the different topics, and these some of these questions you might not have really even thought about yet, but you can find them all here. This is everything that you really need to do well in high school, and we have all of the answers here, and it's all included in our unlimited plan. And when you, when you include our advice and ask and study section all together, it's Brightstorm isn't just about getting help with your homework or studying for tests. It's really about having all the tools that you need to do well for all four years of high school. So we're kind of like a private tutor and a high school counselor all rolled into one. So that's kind of a general idea of how Brightstorm works. I hope you find that helpful, and I hope that you... Uh, take this opportunity to explore Brightstorm after this webinar is over so that you can learn more about the features that we have to offer. What we'd like to know is when you're going to be taking the ACT. You're going to be taking it next week, next month. It's good to know that the information that you're going to find with us today is going to be good no matter when you take the ACT. Looks like we got all of the questions in, and it looks like a lot of you are going to be taking the ACT real soon so this is going to be very important for all of you guys and just to give you a little bit more about who we are uh, we are located in the heart of silicon valley right here in san francisco bay area we started in 2008 over 12 million people have visited our site since then and over 40 million study videos have been played since then also, teachers from over 680 schools across the U.S. have used Brightstorm. So it gives you a kind of a, a, an idea of how successful we've been so far and how much help we've been able to provide all of our students. And we hope that we'll be able to do that with all of you. Okay, so now it's time to get right into the heart of the webinar, which is the ACT subject. And before we do that, I just want to give you a brief background on, on Devorah. Devora is the founder of Advantage Point Test Prep. She's also the author of Boost Your Score, the unofficial guide to the real ACT. She has over 10 years of experience providing students with the information that they need to do well on the ACT. She, a lot of students have found her information really helpful, and we know that you're going to find a lot of useful information from this webinar right now. So take some notes, and after she's done with her presentation, we're going to go over a Q&A session with her where you'll be able to ask her specific questions about the presentation or just questions about the ACT in general. So without further ado, Deborah, take it away. Great. So we are going to be talking about ACT prep in a week, last-minute tips and tricks. So my ideal is that everyone's been prepping up until now. You know, with a test like this, it's best to start early and practice often. But the cool part is, even if you only have a week to go, there's still some really cool last minute tricks that can really help you bring the score up. That's what we're gonna talk about today. So, let's talk about our agenda. First, we're gonna talk about sneaky test day strategies. We'll move to SAT, I'm sorry, ACT English, secret tips and tricks. And then ECT Math, Secret Tips and Tricks. All right, sneaky testing strategies are first. First, we've got exercise. I know you're thinking, Devorah, that's really dumb. It's not. Bear with me. This is cooler than you think, okay? There's some really interesting cutting-edge research that shows that if you exercise for about 5 to 10 minutes right before a complex cognitive task, here, that would be the ECT, right, it will significantly improve performance, sometimes as much as 12 to 15 percent. So what do I mean by exercising right before? You're probably thinking, okay, no problem, Devorah, I'll do my yoga in the morning, and then I'll shower, and then I'll eat my breakfast, and then I'll 
get the test, and that's just not going to work. You might feel good, but that's not the effects that we're talking about here. The most powerful effects will come if you exercise right before the test. So I tell students, park really far away from the test center, and then like power walk or jog or something to get there and you know get yourself a little out of breath. You want to actually be exercising, five to 10 minutes. Um, you could run up and down the stairs like 10 or 15 times. You can go to the bathroom and do jumping jacks. Will you look like an idiot? Yes. Is it worth it? I think so. So again, 12 to 15 percent improvement just from exercising right before. It releases all sorts of cool chemicals, hormones, testosterone is actually one of them, and it really increases focus. Um, don't exercise for more than that because then the oxygen will start going to your muscles instead of your brain. You don't want that. All right. Next, feeling calm. I find that with the September and October ACTs, there's a lot more stress in the room sometimes because there's some seniors taking it and they kind of feel like it might be their last shot or they're running out of chances. And so there's some more stress around that whole test date than there is usually. Um, but generally, a lot of students have test anxiety or just they're worried you know, about how they're going to do. So the research about this is really interesting. And again, this sounds cheesy, feeling calm. What is she going to tell me? It's really interesting. It's cooler than you think. So bear with me. So when we all feel stressed, you know, I think what people think they should do is bury it, right? We all do this. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die. This is terrible. This is terrible. I'll never get into college. And you try to like stuff it in, right? Just stuff it in. So um, the, the thing is, it doesn't work. Um, the, the research shows that we, we can't stuff it down. We actually have to face it. And there's some really interesting ways you can face it. The most powerful ones are with paper or using your dog as a sounding board, actually. So paper is great. You write an essay, and it's a really, you know, make it really, really, um, I would say, almost like vivid, you know, just get it all out there, like whatever you need to, just get it out, get it out, um, you know, this is terrible, my life is over, um, I'm never going to succeed in college, nobody's ever going to, you know, my girlfriend's going to leave me, um, it's the end of the world, you know, anything, I just get it all out. And the interesting thing is if you write it all out on paper and then you tear it up before you walk in the test center and dump it in a trash can, it's like magic, seriously that panic and all that stress is gone. It really works. You can unload on your dog too. That works too. Unloading on people, not as good, honestly. They tend to do stupid things that they think are helpful. Like they'll say, oh, you'll be just fine. Not helpful. Or, oh, that reminds me of the time I took that test or the time I was stressed. And that's not helpful either. So paper, dog, both of them, great ideas. This really increases performance. On several studies they've done, and they, it crosses all ages. They've done this on elementary school, college age, high school, adults. You know, they had people write about neutral things like, these were all people with test anxiety. Some of them wrote about neutral things like favorite ice cream flavor. Others wrote about things like how incredibly stressed they were and how their life was going to be over. And people who got out all their stress did better and reported more feelings of calm, more focus. So this is an important strategy if you have a little bit of stress around test day. Okay, so moving along here. Um, all right, test day strategies, snacks. Okay, so snacks for the 10 minute break that guarantee maximum brain power. So I see students at the 10 minute break because I take these tests with students to stay current and they're talking to each other, right? You probably have done this. And they ask each other questions that are totally useless. Like, well, what did you get on question 19? And then they start freaking out if that person got C and they got E, you know, and it's just, it's all very stressful. And I look at them and I'm kind of judging them a little bit because I'm thinking you should be stuffing your face, okay? You woke up early for test day. Your brain is running a marathon. It's burning so much glucose. And as a result, you really need to eat something. Um, and not a granola bar. That's not going to cut it. So I, I think this is actually a huge tip. I know it sounds kind of silly. But this could mean another point or two or even three, because if you don't eat something substantial at your 10 minute break, you will always have this blood sugar dip that happens, you know, somewhere in the reading or the science, you know, section three or four, like your brain just runs out of glucose and it is done. So keeping yourself, you know, up, pack something substantial. I'll tell you what I bring. It's disgusting. I bring 
I bring canned salmon, I bring hard-boiled eggs, and I bring sausages. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this. One of them is that it smells terrible, so no one will sit next to me, and I don't have to absorb their stress or uh, contribute to it. And another one is that um, another one is that it's just great for just the protein, the fat. You know, I bring something with carbs too, enough to keep you going. All right, so a lot, of, a lot of just just think like you're running a marathon. It just happens to be a brain marathon. Okay. Oh. My slide's not going to the next thing. All right, let me, let's see. Okay, let me try this again. Back to my slideshow. Okay, next, testing strategies, gritting in answers. Okay, so I think what most students do when they answer questions on the ACT is that they'll answer the question, right, from the, from the test booklet, and then they'll shift over to the answer sheet and we'll bubble it in, right, and then they're done bubbling, and then they go back to the test booklet, and they get to the next one, they answer it, then they go and they bubble it in, and then they go back to the test booklet. You can probably tell from how I'm describing this that I think this is totally inefficient, especially, by the way, especially on reading or science, where you've got a series of questions all built around one major passage or science experiment. So then, why keep distracting yourself? You know, where was I again? What was I thinking? You'll find that your focus is, is increased tremendously if you grid in batches. So what we do is we'll open the booklet, and you'll, I do, personally, the two facing pages that I see. So let's say I open to the English section. I've got two pages that face me, okay? And I'll just focus on those. I circle them in the booklet. And you'll find you really get in the zone because you're not shifting back and forth and back and forth. You know, it's a different part of your brain that does the really mundane stuff like gritting versus the really, um, you know, the more intense thinking things like, you know, ACT question answering. So you want to kind of separate those. So I'll, you know, I'll do those two pages and I'll shift over my answer sheet. I'll bubble it in um, and then I'll, I'll flip the page and I'll, I'll do that again. So again, I'm answering just on the booklet. And then later, you know, after those two pages, I'll shift and I'll bubble those in. People forget this, but on the ACT, they're very generous in that the answer choices are A, B, C, D, or F, G, H, J. They switch back and forth, so you're not going to make, make a mistake and miss grade. So that's really helpful. And, you know, try this before test day to make sure it feels good to you, but I assure you, you're, you'll like it. It feels a lot more efficient, and it is a lot more efficient and, and you know, yeah, time efficient and focus. It helps you focus as well. Okay, on to ACT English tips and tricks. So. Okay, first, we're going to talk about when in doubt, take it out. We say about a third of the English questions are testing things like, we call them economy questions, things like redundancy, space fillers, extra punctuation, things that are extra, things that should be shorter, more concise, clearer. Um, so if you're ever not sure on an English question, pick the shortest answer. It's correct about a third of the time, sometimes more. So don't guess blindly on the test. And let's, let's try it. So we're going to try some examples here. I'm going to exit out of the slideshow. I know you can see my screen. And I'm going to head to my internet. Here we go. And we've got, um, I've got some test questions that are up here. So, okay, we've got here, unbreaking a kiln after a firing is like a person uncovering buried treasure. I'm on question number one. And you know what? Let me circle it so you know what we're on. And by the way, there's a couple of different types of questions here. Some of them relate to a different skill. I'll go over in a minute. Um, so we're going to skip around a little bit here, but these are all questions from a real ACT that was up on the ACT website last year. So here we go. Unbreaking a kiln after a firing is like a person uncovering buried treasure. If you're not sure, or you might want to you know, think about it, plug them in. It's like someone uncovering buried treasure, like a potter uncovering buried treasure. Notice the omit. Whenever you see omit, consider it very carefully because it tends to be right. If you can get by with taking something out, you should on the ACT always, okay? So, unbreaking, so here we go. So now my question is, does it work without it? Unbreaking a kiln after firing is like uncovering buried treasure. Sounds good to me, right? And by the way, so it, it is going to be omit. And by the way, if you want to know the real reason that that's right, you know, it's a, a matter of a faulty comparison. You would say, by the way, that unbreaking a kiln 
is like uncovering treasure. You wouldn't compare unbreaking a kiln to a person. Can you see that? But again, if you're stuck or you're just not sure, just remember, when in doubt, take it out. Omit tends to be right. Um, something like number four is an interesting one. We're on, so here we go, we're on four now. Okay. So my friend Ellen is typical of many more potters in that some pieces she shapes on a spinning potter's wheel and others she builds on a work table from coils or slabs of clay. Okay. So you look at this and usually students can see that of many more potters just sounds just terrible, right? It's not going to be that one. So we can cross off of many, okay? I'm sorry, no we can't. Kidding. We can cross off of many more, which is the answer choice F. Okay. So you know what? I wonder actually if I can undo my cross off. I can. All right. So let's say we crossed off F. No change. There you go. So, but still some students get stuck between G and J, right? People usually know it's not H either. You wouldn't say my friend Ellen is typical mostly of potters in that some pieces she shapes on a spinning potter's wheel. That doesn't sound great, but a lot of times students have trouble with idioms. Idioms are words that we just use in the English language, and they don't really have a reason why. I'll give you an example, like if you would say that this points to something or this points at something. There's not really a reason why that one's right over the other. It's just what we say. So here, people have trouble. Do you say something's typical of or typical for? That's the tricky part. So in that case, I would say when in doubt, go short. Literally, you're counting letters here, okay? Of many versus, um, versus for most, I think we're dealing with like one extra, one extra letter here in the for, right? There's that R, and the G is just the shortest option here. And by the way, it happens to be right, but you say that typical, typical of something, okay? Let's look at number five. Over many weeks as time goes by. So over many weeks as time goes by, Look out for redundancies on the ECT, right? I'll give you a second to think about it. I think I kind of gave it away. But what should the answer be? So if you say over many weeks, why do you have to say as time goes by? And notice the omit, too. And sometimes it says delete and not omit. Depends what mood they're in. But, you know, you can just say over many weeks, her collection grows. You don't need to say with the passing of time, gradually. These are all time-related things. And you already said that with the over many weeks, okay? So again, answer choice D, omit is gonna be correct. So remember when in doubt, go short. Pick the answers that are shorter. Pick the answers that take things out. You know, commas are a biggie. It is much more common on the ACT to remove commas or to not put them in than to actually insert them because they know that students tend to overuse commas. Okay, so let, let's keep going. I'm gonna go back to my, my PowerPoint. I'll go to our next tip. So, all right, so that was, when in doubt, take it out. Um, and now we are on to think literally. All right, it kind of sounds dumb, but, but, but bear with me because it's cool. The questions are super, super, super literal. So you have, if you know that they are asking for what they are asking for, you'll zone in on exactly what they want, and only one answer will even remotely be a good idea. Let, so let's try some examples so you see what I mean. So back to my whiteboard. All right, let's see. Now we're up here. Okay, actually, let's go back here. There was one of them here. Number two. Okay, so we're on this one. The writer would like to suggest the potter's cautious pace and sense of anticipation in opening the kiln. Given that all the choices are true, which one best accomplishes the writer's goal? So I think that most of them just read that really quickly, and they don't understand that it's a gift. They are asking for exactly what they're asking for. So I underline keywords here. They want the potter's cautious pace. Wow, that was the worst underline ever. Let me try that again. Cautious pace and sense of anticipation. They mean it. And once you underline that, you can knock up a bunch of answers that just aren't giving you the vibe of cautious pace and sense of anticipation. So let's go through the answers. We want cautious pace, and we want sense of anticipation when she opens the kiln. So what about F? As the potter, that's our no change, as the potter takes bricks away to create an opening. Well, takes bricks away, does that give you a sense of, you know, a cautious pace, sense of anticipation? No, not at all. What about removes bricks by hand? 
right? So as the potter removes bricks by hand, does that give you a sense that it's slow? There's a cautious pace? No, that there's a sense of anticipation? Not really either. So it's not going to be G. What about H? As the potter removes one brick at a time, do you see it? That gives you a sense, like it's slow. Removes one brick at a time. It's slow, you get a cautious pace, you have a sense of anticipation, right? Um, so that, that, that works. You feel like it's kind of building up to something. So it's going to be answer choice H. Note that they very typically will throw in something like J, which throws in words that you're looking for, but is totally overblown and long and clunky. And remember, when in doubt, go short. That's just a really long, overblown way to say that. You know, as the potter experiences great anticipation and removes bricks to create an opening, just it, it, it's just too long. Um, and just too long, actually, as I read back, it doesn't scream cautious pace either. And again, they really need both. So it's not going to be J. Let's go to the, my next uh, my next screen where I had some more of these. Okay, this is still on this, this kiln thing, right, from a real ACT. So round number 10. But, so we have right now, underlined, by nightfall, a controlled inferno roars in the kiln. So the writer would like to indicate that at this point, the fire is extremely intense. They're not kidding. They mean extremely intense. Given that all the choices are true, which one best accomplishes, uh, best accomplishes the writer's goal. So you're thinking extremely intense, okay? So now we go through the answer choices, and only one of them is going to work. So if you look at F, a controlled inferno roars in the kiln. Now, I think vocabulary is really helpful here. Um, I mean, Inferno, if you've ever heard of Dante's Inferno, that's like the fire of hell. So that's intense, and it's roaring. That's super intense. So it's going to be F. But just look at the other answer choices. G, the fire is stronger than ever. That doesn't scream extremely intense. The fire is stronger than ever. Stronger than what? You know, was it like teeny before, and now it's like medium? We just don't know. Um, and, and by the way, H is just as iffy as G. It almost wouldn't be fair for H or G to be right one over the other, because they're functionally the same kind of wimpy way to say that it's a little bit hotter. Um, there's more heat being produced. You know, more heat than what? Like, was it originally zero degrees and now it's 10 degrees? It doesn't scream extremely intense. Can you see that? And then J is similar to that last one we had on that previous one on the other screen a kind of intense phrase takes place. So they'll throw in something that you know is a word you're looking for, like intense. A kind of intense phrase, that's wimpy. You want a controlled inferno roaring, right? So extremely intense. Let's do one more of these and then I'll move on. Number 13, down here. Given that all the choices are true, which one provides the most specific detail and maintains the style and tone of the essay? So they are not kidding. They want the most specific detail and maintaining the silent tone. So over here, we've got, at last, when the temperature soars out of sight, she knows the firing is nearing its end. Okay. Soars out of sight. How vague and wimpy is that? We're told we want the most specific detail. Soars out of sight is not specific. There's no detail there. It's very vague. And by the way, it just wouldn't be fair for A to be right over B. There are both functionally wimpy ways to say that it was getting pretty hot. Um, soars out of sight, rises beyond belief. We want specific detail. And by the way, it also needs to maintain the style and tone of the essay, we're told. So hopefully you looked ahead and you saw that the answer has to be C. This is specific detail, and it's maintaining the style and tone. It's short to the point. It soars well above 1,000 degrees. There you go. Something like D is so similar to the last ones we've been seeing. It's got some keywords we're looking for, but it's just long and clunky and not the best stylistically. You know, you just wouldn't say, as the temperature elevates and increments to the point that a temperature of more than 1,000 degrees is reached. That's just a little painful, actually. All right, so that sums it up for some really quick English strategies that can help you even in a short period of time before the ECT. Thank you so much, Devorah. That was very helpful. And now we're going to open it up to all our attendees for the webinar. Um, if you see on your right-hand side on the, on the, of the control panel, you'll see that there's a question box there. 
and you can ask any question that you want right there, whether it's about the presentation that Devora just presented to you or if it's just a question about the ACT in general. Whatever it is, feel free to write up that question there and then we'll ask Devora to answer that for you. So the first question that we have is, let me send this to Devora, is can we write on the test booklet? Yes, and you should write all over your test booklet, um, especially when it comes to diagrams on the maps, you know, write all over them. We talked about visual estimation. I find that I'm writing, writing on things sometimes to see if they look like how close they are to 90 degree angles, you know, if I'm visually estimating on a geometry problem. On the reading, you want to be really good about marking stuff up. They love lists, so I usually put a big L next to a list in a passage. They love anything extreme. Um, they love contrasts um, and, and conflicts. So, you know, I would really mark up things that look really important on the reading passage as well. Um, I don't find that I underline as much on the English, but definitely the math, the reading, the science too, underlining important parts in the charts and the graphs, very important. Yeah. Great. So the next question that we have is, um, let's see here, is can we write on the English portion of the test booklet? Yeah, I mean, you can write on all of it. Right. Um, and you should. You totally should. All right, next question that we have is, would you recommend exercising too at the 10-minute break? So I do that, and I look like an idiot. And you know what? Some of my students, we kind of have a reputation because we're the crazy people doing, like, jumping jacks in the bathroom. But, and you also have to figure out your order because I also want students to be eating. So it's like, do you work out and then you eat? Or, like, do you eat and then, like, get all nauseated from, like, doing your jumping jacks? I mean, don't go crazy. But I, I just go to the bathroom. I do a few jumping jacks, just enough that my heart rate is a little increased. Again, you don't want to do too much. You don't want your oxygen to go to your muscles instead of your brain. Um, and by the way, for that reason, you don't want to eat too much either. You don't want your oxygen going to your stomach instead of your brain like it does on Thanksgiving, you know, when you eat a lot. But you want to eat like lunch. You want to eat something substantial. And I would work out. I would. I would exercise a little bit, you know. And you can do it somewhere, somewhere kind of hidden if you feel really stupid. But it's, it's worth it. It really is. Okay, great. So the next question is, what answer choice is best to pick when you are totally guessing? When guessing many questions, should you stay consistent? That's a great question. Um, I wish there was a magic answer, you know, like always pick C. What you should do is always pick in a column. Um, we call it the letter of the day. You know, so let's say you decide you're going to go with that first column, which is A, F, A, F. You know, the answers go back and forth between A, B, C, D, F, G, H, A, A, F, A, F. Or you can pick the middle column and do C, H, C, H. But you want to do it in a column and not jump around everywhere. And the statistics are much more heavily in your favor if you're in a column. Because if you think like the test makers, so it's just they're, they're kind of thinking of what are the right answers for these different questions. It would just be really unfair if they never made the right answer be, you know, A or F. Like, at some point, the right answer is going to hit that column, whereas if you jump all over the place, you're not guaranteed anything. So definitely, if you're going to guess, pick a column and stick with it, but there's not a magic letter, unfortunately, for which, which one to go for. Good question. The next question is, hi, Devorah. Great webinar. I had a question in English. How do commas work on ACT English? For example, I ate chips, comma, salsa, chocolates, comma, and fried chicken for a snack. Is there a comma before or after and? Thanks. Love the question. So you're asking really, I think, about Oxford comma. Um, the ACT won't test it because it's so controversial. Um, what you typically will have is commas in one of three situations. You'll have a comma for like a shift or a pause, um, and we've all kind of, we all can usually feel that comma. Like if I said to someone, you know, you're one of the homecoming queen's friends, comma, aren't you? You know, like, you, I kind of wish, think I should type this. Can you guys still see my screen? 
I believe so. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So maybe, let me see if I can, maybe I'll even type it here. So let's say, I'm going to make this small font. Um, so let's say, you know, I say, your one, can you guys see that? Is it too small? small. It's a little small. All right, I'm going to make it bigger. Here, like, in this kind of situation, you, I feel like you feel a shift. You know, you're one of her friends, aren't you? So it's kind of like, you're shifting to someone almost and asking them something. So that would be one example where you feel a shift or a pause. The other example would be a list, like you asked, but it would not be a comment in that spot, you know, before before the and. It would be something like, you know, he went and bought chips, soda, and beer. And you could totally put a comment after the soda. Or you could not put a comma after the soda. That's not going to be tested. That's a controversial comma, actually. They would test the comma over here, you know, the one between the chips and the soda, if you were going to have a list. But more likely on the ACT, you're removing commas. And they'll stick commas in for two things that aren't a list. You know, you need three or more things for a list. Um, and the other comma incidents I tell students to look for very closely is what I call a comma sandwich. You double comma, you put a comma on both sides of something if it's not essential to the meaning of the sentence. So if I said something like, you know, that Tuesday, on the other hand, works for me. What you really care about is that that Tuesday works for me, right? Because I'm sticking in something almost parenthetical, I could totally put that in parentheses on the other hand, right? I need a double comma on both sides. Other examples are words like, you know, it turns out, you know, Rosie, it turns out, is a turtle. You can just say, Rosie is a turtle. You know, that Tuesday, which happens to be my birthday, is the day of the finale. You could just say that Tuesday is the day of the finale. Nobody really cares that it's your birthday. It's not the point, you know? So ask yourself on the ACT. These are all over the place. If you can replace it with parentheses, if it's not essential to the meaning of the sentence, it should get a double comma. That's a really popular question type. Great. Thank you so much for that, Deborah. The next question is, on the reading section, oh, I'm sorry, no. The next question is, what was your composite score when you took the ACT, Deborah? Uh, well, I got a perfect score, which is why I, I do this. My mom keeps saying, don't you want to go to law school or something? And I say, no, this is the best thing ever. The reason is because the ACT is so predictable. It really is that if you, it's like cracking a code. If you work hard enough at it, you just same, see the same skills repeatedly. You can get a handle on it. It's just, it's doable. It's crackable. It's actually really fun, I think. Awesome. Yeah. And so next question, on the reading section, do you suggest to read slash skim the passages first or go straight to the questions? So I know some people go, say to go straight to the questions. I don't agree with them, but I know it works for some people. I, I find that really inefficient. I think if you read the questions, then you go back and read the passage, then you have to remind yourself about what the 10 questions were that were on the passage and go back. I just, I just don't see how that's efficient. So I do the passage first, um, but I don't read the whole thing. Um, and that's what we, our students, we tell our students to do. Now there's four passages. The first one is always fiction. You know, that's the one that reads more like a story you'd read for fun. That one you have to read the whole thing. You know, you miss a line or two and somebody could have died and you have no idea. But the last three passages are always nonfiction. They're like trying to teach you something like, oh, let me teach you about electric eels. You know, let me teach you about the little ice age. So in those cases, you generally don't read the whole thing. I read the first paragraph. I read the first line or two of each of the middle paragraphs just to get a sense of the topic sentence so I know what's going to be in that paragraph if I need it. And then I'll read the whole last paragraph. And if you think about any kind of good essay that's trying to teach you something, that's the important stuff. It's like, first paragraph, let me tell you what I'm going to tell you. Last paragraph, let me tell you what I told you. And then in between, you're, they're kind of building the argument. So I do that. I just skim through it very quickly. Then I head to the questions. I do the line reference questions first. So then I'll go back and read those lines, you know, like in line 15, all right, well now line 15 matters. So I would read around that area, but I'm reading to answer that question. So it's a lot more aggressive. And by backing out and doing that quick skim like we do, you know, 
you actually can usually get a lot of the questions more easily that are big picture questions, like you know the author's overall purpose or the main idea. And you can even get those, I think, more easily by backing out of the passage instead of being like really nitty gritty about every little detail of the passage. Good question. Next question is, for the essay portion, do you have to write a counter argument for every argument you write in your essay? It's a great question. You know, they say to get a 12, you do. Yeah, so the strongest essays, I wouldn't do it for everyone, but I would do it for at least one of them. The strongest essays, like a 12 essay, will do some sort of nod to the other side and then a refutation, which I think is what you're referring to, you know, but um, you can totally get a 10 or 11 essay with just two of your own very strong arguments, not even three, just two. Another question is, what does it mean that there is no penalty for guessing? So I love that about this test. You're only getting points for the right answers. So literally what they'll do is count up all your right answers. So they'll ignore the wrong ones, and they count up the right ones, and then they, that's just a number. That's the raw amount you got right. So let's say you got, I don't know, 75 right on the English out of 75. So that will then transfer. They have like a, you know, kind of a raw to scaled score equation that transfers to a 36. You know, if you got, let's say, 70 right on the English, that would probably transfer to about a 32. Um, so again, they're just literally counting how many are right. This is very different from a test like the SAT where they'll take a quarter point off for every wrong answer. Um, so it's a totally different kind of scoring mechanism. All right, next question. What about the science part of the ACT? Any tips? What are areas of science are what areas of science are covered? Great question. So officially, you don't need external scientific knowledge. It's really charts and graphs. Um, so with those, you generally don't have to read very much at all. And students get very intimidated because there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of you know questions about how experiments were were done, and and it just looks like there's a lot of stuff you have to understand. About 90% of the questions can be done by just reading the charts or graphs. So I don't read anything. Um, the one exception is that there is one passage out of the seven. There are seven passages. There's one that's we call the conflicting viewpoints, and that's two, usually two fighting scientists or two conflicting theories, and that's a lot of reading. That's a lot of reading about just different hypotheses, and then you, you have seven questions there about how those theories, you know, compare or contrast. But everything else, I've been doing experiments, and you've got a lot of graphs and charts, and about 90% of the time, you don't need any of the words, like any of the, the background or the um, introduction or the experimental method. You can just skip over that. So I tell students, go right to the questions, look up the stuff in the charts or graphs. In each passage, so there's seven passages on the science, important to know this, in each one of them individually, the questions are roughly in order of difficulty. This is very empowering to know because it's stupid to stress out about the last question in a, in a, in a passage when if you flip the page, you'd be at a brand new passage and you're looking at easy questions. You know, and then the next few are going to be the easy ones. And then as you get to the end of that passage, the questions will get harder and harder. And the last one tends to be the hardest. And then you flip the page, it goes easy to hard on each passage. So that means that if you're really stuck on a last question in a passage, it's not worth it. You know, guess and keep going, push yourself along, because it's really frustrating when students run out of time and they never even get to the easy questions on the last passage. So those are all really great questions, um, and we also hope that you found all the information that Devorah had to offer really useful. Um, if so, we'd like you to answer this question. Just let us know what you thought about the presentation and the Q&A session.